All right, we're moving on now to the fifth chapter of the book of Acts. And uh, let's, uh, let's read the text. I'm on page number 73 of our notes. Let's read the text that's included on that page, and we'll look at the outline after that in the introduction. <clears throat> but a certain man named Ananias and Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession and kept back part of the price. His wife also, being privy to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? Whiles it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not thine own power, in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost, and great fear came on them, all them, that heard these things. And the young men arose, wound him up, and carried him out and buried him. And it was about the space of three hours after when his wife, not knowing what was done, came in. And Peter answered unto her, Tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, Yea, for so much. And Peter said unto her, How is it that ye have agreed together to tempt the Spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of them which have buried thy husband are at the door and shall carry thee out. Then fell she down straightway at his feet and yielded up the ghost. And the young men came in and found her dead and carrying her forth, buried her by her husband in great fear, came upon all the church and upon as many as heard these things. You talk about summary justice. Wow. This church is, uh, this setting is a little bit different than today. Can you imagine Everybody that, anybody that lied to the Holy Ghost, even in his, what would seemingly be a small manner is how much you sold a piece of land for, if everybody dropped dead, that certainly would uh, have a lot to do with uh, dealing with uh, the overpopulation of our world, would it not? Notice at the top of the page, the outline is the deception then the continued, in spite of that, the continued success of the church, the persecution does not get less, but it intensifies. Peter declares the church's loyalty, that is who we are and what we're going to do in spite of the persecution. Gamaliel helps the elders. They're having a tough time figuring out what are we going to do with these Christians? And so he gives them some advice and he strategizes with them how they can handle this in a wise fashion. The apostles then show their persistence. So we've read the text, the bottom of page 73. We've been examining and studying the church at its very beginning. Our goal has been to learn what made them tick and what was important and what was it high, uh, high priority or top priority with them. The Bible is written in just such a way. It's not merely a history book or a theology book. It's a practical guide to living and carrying out our faith. <clears throat> the Bible is an instruction manual for life. Oftentimes, I reference it accordingly. We've noted, top of page 74, that the church uh, is uh, and has been riding a wave. Success. Good things have been happening, but there's also some uh, signs of uh, negative things, persecution on the horizon. We dealt with that uh, earlier in our study, and we're going to deal with it again very, very sh shortly. With all of this as the backdrop to chapter number five, we enter a scenario where human nature invades the tightly knit together group of people we call the church. The church is already successfully faced resistance and opposition. Now it comes from within. And as I said before, churches generally do not, are not destroyed or come apart because of outside pressures, but churches come apart because of internal strife and division. We're going to look at the reasons for that 
why churches divide, why there's internal strife and division in just uh, a few moments here. All of this serves as a background, but we see here in chapter number five, we read of an attack from within, Ananias and Sapphira. They're spiritual pretenders. Remember, the previous chapter ended with an account of Barnabas selling his property and bringing forth the proceeds and making it available to the apostles, laying those proceeds at the apostles' feet. He did this with a pure heart, intending to do good, uh, and he was above board. What he did was for everyone to see and to understand. But what takes place here is these people, Ananias and Sapphira, they want to be received as well. They want to be looked upon favorably by this early church congregation just as certainly Barnabas was. So they are pretending to be more spiritual than they really are. In fact, it doesn't say anywhere, or doesn't suggest to me anywhere, that they had to sell the land and give all of it. What they did is they pretended to give all of it. They pretended to give a greater percentage than they really did. They wanted to, people to look favorably upon them at the expense of lying to God. They weren't so concerned about what God thought about their gift. They were more concerned about what people thought of their gift. And whenever we consider what people think more than what God thinks of us, we are going to find ourselves in trouble. God is an impartial judge. He knows it all. We can't fool him. We can fool people easily, fool people. We're all easily deceived. But God is never deceived. God knows the truth. So here we see in these first 11 verses, we begin to see division. We've seen nothing but positive, even amongst the persecution. The responses were very positive. But now we see division. And uh, we've entitled this Division in Inside Job. No one at FBBC should be unaware of this human reality. The realization of this has caused many an author to write of the importance of striving for unity inside the church. Nothing renders any organization. This could be a business. This could be a family. This could be a church. Nothing renders an organization more powerless than exhausting itself by dealing with internal strife and problems. The energy that could be used to accomplish the mission or the stated purpose of the organization is then directed towards dealing with internal problems. Division is an inside job. Ephesians, Paul writes, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. Endeavoring, verse 3 says, working hard at this, endeavoring, laboring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There's one body, one spirit even as you're called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. 1 Corinthians tells us that there should be no schism in the body. And verse 26 of 1 Corinthians 12 says, and whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. We're in this together. Church problems are our problems in our church. We need to face them together. We have business meetings every year, at least one, and at that time we review our successes and our failures. And we are asking people in our fellowship, in our congregation, to be encouraged by the good things that are happening, for sure, but pull together in the areas where we need maybe greater effort a greater effort on the part of individuals. 
Romans 14 says, let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and things wherewith one may build up, edify. That's what the word edify means, another. We're to build one another up. When one is down, another is up and can encourage those who are going through difficult times. There may be just depression. Maybe just things aren't going well for them in their lives. Everybody has problems. When you walk into your church building on Sunday morning, surely, probably 20%, if not more, of the people that are there that day are going through some kind of difficulty, problem that has them down, maybe has discouraged them in some way. You never know. A kind word that you might say, something that you do for that individual by going out of your way to show deference toward them, it might be all they need to pick them up. One of the characteristics or attributes of God is that God is one. He's a unit, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. One of the attributes of God is unity. We think of um, that God is everywhere. He's omnipresent. We think of God as omniscient. He's all-knowing. We think of God as immutable. He never changes. Now, those three attributes are not communicable. We cannot share in those. But there is an attribute of God that we can share in, and that is we can share in the attribute of love. God is love. We can experience love. We can be loving, but we can also experience unity and togetherness. That is a communicable attribute of God. So let's, in this chapter, let's consider some things that bring division. In this case, number one is pride in the middle of page 75. Spiritual pretense. Ananias and Sapphira were not required to sell their property. They were not required to give all the proceeds to the apostles. However, they sold the property and pretended to be like Barnabas. Their sin was not lying to the congregation, although they did, probably. It was lying to the Holy Ghost. Sin is primarily an offense against God. We can, <clears throat> we can offend people, and we do from time to time. Maybe wrongfully and maybe not. But when we offend God, we're doing it wrongfully. We offend God. God is absolute. God is holy and God is righteous. And when God is offended by us, he's offended by our unrighteousness. Their great sin was lying to God. They pretended to be something that God knew they were not. They were guilty of lying, motivated by the desire to exalt self. Humility is the antidote for pride. It is the opposite of pride. Be careful. All of us, all of us have a tendency to be arrogant and prideful and say, look at me, me first, everybody else second. We all have that tendency. <coughs> Excuse me. I know... I have that tendency. Let me grab a drink here just for a second. I'll be right back. Let me grab something before I choke on myself. We all have the tendency to be self-centered. It's part of our fallen and broken human nature. Pride. Pride. We see pride. It was the, it was the sin that brought about Satan's demise. We see that under number one. Spiritual pretense on the part of Ananias and Sapphira. Satan's pride was pride. Satan's sin was pride. Notice Proverbs 13, verse 10. One of my favorite verses because it's such a, an obvious truth. Only by pride cometh contention. When we've got a division, when we're mad at somebody, pride is in the middle of that thing somewhere. It's self-exaltation, the antidote, humility. I like what James says in chapter 4. But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. So pride creates division. Possessiveness, page 76. We might call this covetousness, selfishness, narcissism. It's an extension or a manifestation 
of pride. That's all it is. We not only want God and people to believe that we are better than we really are, but that we deserve more than we really have. That happens all the time. And Paul addresses that when he says in 2 Corinthians that we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. Human beings are forever making comparisons in evaluations of themselves and those around us. Particularly young people are really caught up in this. Hopefully as we age and we become more mature, we begin to get over ourselves and we actually focus our attention on the well-being of others rather than just ourselves. We would hope so by the time you become a parent, a parent that you're concerned about others other than just yourself. But we compare, we exalt, we get embittered, we get jealous, we divide. All of these things are, are issues of comparing ourselves with one another. The antidote for this is generosity and giving. Giving to someone else. To get over myself in my need and how important I really think I am, I need to look at what I have and say, you know what? I don't necessarily deserve all of this. In fact, I don't need all of this. How can I help somebody else that has less or has a need that, uh, that I recognize? That will attack your pride. Giving deals with pride. Personalities is something else that divides. It's not only pride, it's not only possessiveness, but people. And we see that in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, where the Corinthians were caught up in, in who are, who, who, I'm an apostle of, you know, of, of Simon Peter. I'm an apostle of Apollos. I'm an apostle of Pastor Grace. I'm an apostle of Pastor Brown. I'm a believer. I follow so-and-so, this individual. And we, again, it becomes an issue of pride. Personalities become more important than Christ himself. Humans want to live under the shadow or umbrella of famous or privileged people, popular people, well-respected people. We like to drop names. You'll never guess who I had lunch with last week. I had lunch with blah, blah, blah. And we think that by mentioning their name and we were present with them in this particular environment, that that lifts us up closer to the level of the type of person that they are. Yes, I had lunch with my senator last week. That makes me important. In fact, what it does is it makes me more important than you. Did you have lunch with the senator last week? Now that's the thinking that goes behind a lot of those statements and the worship of personalities, whether they're sports figures or whether they're movie figures or political figures or wealthy people or accomplished people. We like to be identified with them because it lifts us up closer to their level. That can be divisive. Number four, preferences. Preferences tend to divide. And that's also a function of pride. I'm talking about preferences. The kind of clothing that you wear. The kind of phone that you have. How big your flat screen TV is. Or whether you even have a flat screen TV. Frankly, me and my family, we have rejected our culture, and we don't watch television. We don't watch videos. We are not on the internet. Are you not impressed with our holiness? Our degree of separation? So what we do is that becomes a function of our pride, our preferences. We can take good things and ultimately make them bad. You can see others as inferior because they are another, maybe of another generation, gender, race, social status, musical tastes, culture, etc., etc. 
why do I think everybody should be like me? Frankly, at this age, I'm glad everybody isn't like me. What a boring, crummy world it would be. Is this not again a function of our pride? What is the antidote? The fact is that God made everything good. Whether it's red or yellow, black and white, whatever the color is, whatever the taste is, whatever the clothing, etc., and we're talking about modesty, obviously, God made everything good. And you know, I like the variety of life now. I like to see the different things. There are people that may wear things that I would never wear, but that doesn't mean I look at them and say, well, they're stupid or they're dumb for wearing that. I'd never wear that. I try to look at the good in the diversity of all of it, the plant world, the animal world, the universe in which we live. God made a very diverse creation. There are so many different things that we see and touch and taste and feel, we should learn to smell the roses and appreciate them. So preferences in churches divide. What kind of music we like or what side of the platform we want the piano or what color the carpeting is. Do we want windows or do we want pews or do we want chairs? Do we want theater seating? Do we want? And we get upset because we don't get things necessarily the way we prefer them to be. Personal judgments and perceptions. They divide viewpoints, ideas. There's a whole list of words at the bottom of page 77 that illustrate the idea of perception. We, don't, we all don't see things the same. That's okay. It's all right. It's good for you to try to get along with people who are different than you are. When it comes to these terms, page 78, or concepts, we're all equal? Wrong. What human being is, is, is all perceptive? The whole idea of viewpoint is subjective. We say, in essence, you must see from my vantage point. No, not necessarily. Not everybody does. <laughs> Maybe your wife doesn't or your husband doesn't even see things from your vantage point. Your family members in your own home see things differently. And it surprises you that they're not as smart as you. Maybe we need to be a little bit more forgiving. We see in uh, Acts chapter 15, there was even disagreements among the disciples. We've recorded here the, the, the disagreement or the contention between Paul and Barnabas. They had a different idea about John Mark, and it caused disagreement and contention. Who was right? Who was wrong? I don't know that the Bible says. Maybe they were both wrong. If you think that your perceptions or your intuition or your insight or your viewpoint is superior to everybody else's, you got a pride problem again. In some areas of life, we live with other people's choices because they are their choices. That's a, diff that's a difficulty that needs to be overcome when we come into a marriage relationship. When we're in love, we overlook a lot of differences when we're dating and when we're engaged, maybe even when we're first married. But as we get to used to one another in a marriage relationship, what happens is, is we start becoming increasingly more intolerant of the differences or the preferences of our mate. They don't necessarily like the same foods that we like. They don't like the same kind of vacations that we like. They don't like the same kind of clothing that we like. They may not like the same kind of friends that we have. And we get upset that they make different choices and have, again, different preferences. Pride says, in a marriage relationship and in any relationship, I am right and you are wrong. Have you ever done that to your spouse? I'm right and you are wrong. Let me ask you, how far does that get you with that kind of an attitude? It doesn't get you very far at all. Not at all. We need to become more accepting, more tolerant, of our spouses, of our family members, of our friends. I try, I try to do that. My wife says, what would you like for dinner? 
She knows what I like. I say, I, I don't care what we have. What time do you want to eat? I don't care unless we have an appointment or we have some kind of commitment later on. Where do you want to go if we're going to go out to dinner? Where would you like to go? I don't care, wherever you want to go. Now, I don't do that with everything, but I do that a lot more today than I used to. Used to be, as a younger man, much more opinionated and wanted my way. At this point, it hasn't served me well in the years gone by. A good antidote is this. We know that everybody has choices, and they're their choices, and it's okay. It doesn't mean they're wrong if their choice is different than mine. We're not talking about morality here. But a good attitude towards the pride of I'm right and you're wrong is simply Romans chapter 3. We're all sinners. We've all come short of the glory of God. And I need to look at myself first. I'm a sinner. I may not have the same perception or viewpoint that my mate or my friend or my pastor or whoever it is, so I see things differently. And my pride rises up within me and says, I want to go to this restaurant. I want to go there on vacation. I want to do it this way. To the exclusion of the opinion of others who are involved. That's sinfulness. I'm a sinner, and I've come short of the glory of God. You first, me second. That's humility. Again, the antidote. The antidote to pride. Purpose and priorities also are divisive. What's the main thing? This is something worthy of consideration. This is not a matter of pride. It's a question of principle. When we bring this into the church, is the church fulfilling its biblically staged purposes in the world? How about your family? How about as parents? Are you fulfilling the top priorities and purposes for you as a parent and providing for your spouse, for your children, for extended members of your family? What is your purpose? What are your priorities in life? When our priorities get out of sync, when they're out of order, when we prioritize things that are of less importance than those that are of greater importance, it begins to create division and problems. When it comes to marriage, again, husbands and wives need to have a common set of priorities. That doesn't mean that we like the same kind of foods or clothing or vacation spots or the kind of automobile that we drive and all of that. Those are secondary issues. But as a couple, as a family, as a married couple and as parents, we need to have certain things that are priorities that we agree upon. And we also need those as church members. We've listed them here at the bottom of page number 78. These are questions not of pride. These are is issues of principle as number seven is. Principle, doctrine. We must determine what the essential doctrines of Christianity are. This is a path that has been well-worn historically. We've listed. There are things that are essentials. These are orthodox Christian beliefs. When we get into churches, your church, the people in your church, our church, need to subscribe to what's on this first list of essentials. Now when it comes to the non-essentials, not that I don't have an opinion about each of these things, but they are non-essentials. That is, I can get along with Christian people who have a different take on apostolic gifts, church government, biblical translations, eschatology, the issue of predestination, etc., etc., etc. I can still have fellowship with people who have different belief systems in those. But the list at the top of that page, what are the essentials? These are things that are essential Christian truths and doctrines historically. We must agree on these. You can see that the vast majority of these points has to do with the issue of pride. A me-first mentality is always destructive to unity, cooperation, and success. Most churches are divided over the first five issues. Pride issues. Not principle issues, not doctrinal issues, but pride issues. 
that's where I see the greatest division. Same thing I might add in marriage relationships, in family relationships. It's pride. Pride and selfishness are our greatest enemies in our relationships with people. Generally not principles. Your wife doesn't need a jury trial and need to be committed to five years imprisonment for the way she behaves at home. She hasn't done something that's against the law. She may have done something that isn't your personal taste or your personal priority when it comes to eating a meal or the places you go. We're not talking about principles. We're not talking about behavior. We're not talking about morality in the sixth and seventh issues that divide us. We're, we're, uh, we're talking about principles here, biblical principles. And, 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 and maybe I misstated that. In six and seven, we're talking about principles. In the first five things, we're talking about our own personal preferences and putting ourselves first. There really is only two issues. Pride and principle. Pride has to do with my relationship with people. Principle has to do with my relationship with God. Those are the two things that I always have to consider. When I put myself first, I bring division, whether it's before other people or whether it's before my belief and my trust in God and the principles of God's word. So our review here. Self-exaltation or pride is divisive. Humility is the antidote. Possessions or possessiveness is divisive. Generosity is the antidote. <clears throat> Personality worship, that is, having your eyes on men, is divisive. The antidote is Christ. We ought to have our eyes on Jesus. Personal preferences can be divisive. The antidote is an understanding of God's creativity and his diversity. Personal judgments and perceptions can be divisive. The antidote, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I can be wrong. Purpose and priorities, always keep the main things the main things. Consult your Bible for those things. Principles, doctrine matters. Everything we do falls naturally out of what we believe, what we believe about God, what we believe about the Bible, what we believe about creation, what we believe about sin, what we believe about all those major truths and doctrines. Our behaviors in our lives fall out naturally from what we believe. We need to be careful. Proverbs 13, verse 10 says, Only by pride cometh contention. What led to the demise of Ananias and Sapphira? They wanted everybody to think that they were as good, as generous, as spiritual as Barnabas. It was their pride that was their demise. And it was their pride that stood to cause division in that first local church. Let's take a couple moments now. We'll take a break and we'll come back and we'll finish chapter number five in the next lesson.